Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm Andrew Schwartz. I'm our Senior Vice President for External Relations here, a poor substitute for John Hamry, who was called away, but nonetheless, I'm here. Um, we, just a, a couple good housekeeping measures. We do this for every event now, just because it's the way Washington works. If there is an emergency, um, there is emergency exits right out the back here. You'll go right out that door and through the door and it'll follow signs back. We'll have staff out there posted um, and we'll let you know how to get out of here, but we don't expect any problems. We're very lucky today to have this program in such a timely um, series of events. Uh, Senator Bob Menendez's story is a quintessential American story. He grew up the son of Cuban immigrants in a tenement building in Union City, New Jersey, and has risen to become uh, one of the most prominent uh, members of the United States Senate. He, of course, served as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in the 113th Congress and is now the ranking member. Um, we're so fortunate to have Senator Menendez here today and to hear from him uh, on this very, very timely subject. Senator Menendez, please. Well, thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon. I'm sorry that we're starting a few minutes late, but the bullet train from Newark to Washington was late, so um, I appreciate uh, your patience. Uh, let me thank CISIS for inviting me. It's a pleasure uh, to share the stage with one of the most distinguished and accomplished foreign policy practitioners whose perspective on our strategic dilemma giving Putin's revisionist Russia will be enlightening. So Dr. Brzezinski, I look forward to hearing your remarks and participating in a discussion with you. I think that without any doubt, we can all agree on one key point. The United States must lead. Now, there are many experts, I'm sure, many here, who would contend that the complexity of the geopolitics that led the U to the U.S.'s retreat from Europe created an opening for Putin. We know that we must work in close coordination with our European friends in order for the sanctions against Russia to work. But I do think there is a greater role for strong American leadership. It has never been in our nature to simply observe. In my view, it is in our strategic interest to be an active participant in leading any effort to counter Russia. But I'm concerned that our friends, particularly in Eastern Europe, question are resolved. We need to send a very clear global message. If you violate and upend the international order, there will be consequences. And we have to mean it when we say it, and we have to back up our words with a menu of agreed upon actions that will follow. There should be no ambiguity about either our resolve or what actions we would consider. The fact is that there are other actors in the world who are looking, looking at what is happening in the Ukraine and saying, well, what did the United States do? What did the West do to stop Putin's aggression? And at the end of the day, if the answer is the West did not do enough, then other actors, those who may be more powerful than their neighbors, actors who may have nuclear weapons like North Korea, will have the space to think about what they might want to do. We cannot give them that space. Whether it's China in the South China Sea that has territorial disputes with our allies, South Korea and Japan, or the challenge we face with a nuclear armed North Korea, or the challenge of Maduro in Venezuela oppressing his people, I could go through a long list of global actors who, in the absence of assured consequence for violating the international order, will be emboldened. That is an incredibly risky world to live in. That said, when it comes to Putin's aggression in Ukraine, the administration should fully implement measures in the Ukraine Freedom Support Act, which the president signed into law on December the 18th and that I helped author. The legislation passed with unanimous consent in both houses of Congress. It authorizes the president to provide much needed military and humanitarian aid to Ukraine, and it imposes additional sanctions against Russia. This legislation was necessary in December, and it is even more necessary today. Implementing it is an important first step, but we also need to address the threat that Russia poses across Europe in a more comprehensive way. We need to reinvigorate the institutions that have so long contributed 
to the transatlantic relationship in peace and stability. We need to sharpen our arsenal of response options, and that means NATO and EU integration and adapting them to today's realities. And that will require streamlining the cumbersome bureaucratic procedures to bring nations into the Western fold more quickly. We need to see TTIP in security terms, as it will send a strong message to Putin that the United States and Europe are unified. When it comes to energy, Europe will never be fully secure unless and until it has energy security. We need to do more to support efforts in Europe to increase reverse flow capacity from countries like Poland, Slovakia, Hungary to Ukraine. Our friends in Northern Europe and the Baltics need help in developing LNG infrastructure. Countries across the region, but particularly Bulgaria, Croatia, Hungary, Serbia, are vulnerable to Russia's eagerness to use energy as a weapon. And our allies in Southern Europe also need the energy security provided by LNG infrastructure and pipelines. In my view, the attention on Europe's east in confronting the threat from Russia has been necessary. But we also need to focus on the south, also vulnerable to undue Russian influence. We need to strengthen security and economic relationships in the Balkans, especially in Serbia, Montenegro, Bulgaria, and Bosnia. To put it simply, the rules that have been put in place since the end of the Cold War, in my view, no longer apply. We need to fundamentally recalibrate our approach to security in Europe and treat the entire region as under threat, not just Ukraine. In my view, we need to stop all force withdrawals from Europe and conduct a review of our force posture. The European Reassurance Initiative is a good first step, and we cannot let up uh, this momentum, and Congress should provide a long-term authorization for the initiative. We should consider a robust military presence in the Baltics and other threatened states. Let Putin know that it's up to him as to how long we stay there. In the Baltics and Eastern Europe, we should not be thinking in terms of battalions, which are about five or 600 soldiers. We should be think thinking in terms of brigades, which are three to 5,000 soldiers. Unfortunately, there is no shortcut to security. Now, there has been some positive movement in this direction. Colonel Michael Foster of the 173rd Airborne Brigade recently said that exercises between U.S. troops with Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, which began last April and will expand through the summer. Operation Atlantic Resolve will continue in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland with about 900 soldiers. And I understand that this effort could also expand into Hungary, the Czech Republic, and Georgia, which I would support. Our intelligence community also needs to reprioritize the Russian threat, not only addressing the immediate security threat in Ukraine, but across the broad in Europe. I understand the administration is working with the Broadcasting Board of Governors to commit $23 million to Russian language programming, a 49 percent increase since fiscal year 14. The State Department has also requested more than $20 million in foreign assistance and public diplomacy funds to counter Russian propaganda through training for Russian-speaking journalists, support for civil society, watchdogs and independent media, exchange programs, and access to fact-based news. The Russian investment, and I've heard this both in my trips when I was in Ukraine last year in the midst of the invasion and other countries that I was there in Poland and Estonia, I heard, and since then, uh, as they've, many have come to visit in Washington, have told me about the overwhelming Russian propaganda machine uh, that, of course, is not based in facts, uh, and ultimately overwhelms the ability of states in the region uh, to counter it. It dwarfs what we have dedicated to the task. If we are serious about countering Russian propaganda, we need to increase our investments in coordination with the Europeans, who should also dedicate resources to these efforts. Now, there are also reports that the Russian government provides funding for political parties, NGOs, and think tanks across Europe. If this is indeed the case, we need a broader soft power strategy to counter this influence, and we should work to leverage our State Department public diplomacy and USAID programming towards that end. And when it comes to security assistance to the Ukraine, we need to urgently increase both the economic and human cost to Putin with tougher sanctions and provide more assistance to the Ukrainian military. The international community simply cannot remain passive 
in the face of such unbridled aggression that will only invite further aggression. U.S. Army Europe Commander Lieutenant General Ben Hodges said in a recent speech in Berlin that providing weapons in Ukraine would not immediately improve Ukraine's defensive capability, but it would provide the necessary muscle for a diplomatic solution. At a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing on March the 4th, General Dempsey said, I think we should absolutely consider providing lethal aid. And it ought to be in the context of our NATO allies, NATO allies because Putin's ultimate objective is to fracture NATO. The simple fact is, we all want a diplomatic solution to this problem. But I believe this can only come about when Putin believes that the cost of continuing to ravage Ukraine is simply too high. We have a responsibility to increase that cost. We are providing uh, non-lethal equipment like night vision goggles, and that's all well and good. But if I can see the enemy, but I have no wherewithal to stop them, it really uh, is not responding to the fundamental challenge. Let's provide counter-artillery radars, tactical troop-operated surveillance drones, and secure command and communications equipment. Let's provide anti-tank and anti-armor weapons, crew weapons, and ammunition. Frankly, I'm, I'm disappointed that the administration, required to report on its plan for increasing military assistance to Ukraine on February the 15th, under the law that was signed, has yet to do so. And we are awaiting that report. In the meantime, Putin has used his military power to impose his will in Ukraine, but he's also using every economic tool at his disposal, and we must do the same. It's time, in my view, to impose additional targeted sanctions on the Russian Economic Center to add to existing sanctions that are already costing the Russian economy about $140 billion per year, or about 7 percent of its economy. The administration should tighten restrictions on the development of shale deposits, Arctic drilling, and offshore drilling. I don't think that we want to use American technology to have a Russian oil shale revolution uh, and further rehab its grasp uh, into Europe and elsewhere as a result of it. The Ukraine Freedom Support Act called for the administration to impose sanctions on other defense industry targets as well as on special Russian crude oil projects by January 31st. And we are still waiting on the administration's response. There are almost 150 individuals and entities on the EU and Canadian sanctions list that are not on the U.S. list. The head of the Russian FSB, Mr. Bortnikov, is the most egregious example. The same Mr. Bortnikov who was in Washington recently for the CVE conference. If there is no justifiable reason for excluding these individuals, they should be added. Clearly, for the international sanctions effect to be effective, we need to be in lockstep with our Canadian and European allies. Finally, these sanctions are necessary, but the most effective sanction is an economically viable and stable Ukraine. Working with our European friends, we need to do all we can to ensure that. On March 2nd, the Ukrainian parliament enacted the eight laws required by the International Monetary Fund. On Wednesday, the IMF Executive Board should approve the four-year extended fund facility, which will offer Ukraine about $40 billion of credits, of which $17.5 billion is to come from the IMF itself. This is a very significant step that will help greatly. The U.S. may provide an additional $1 billion in loan guarantees towards the end of this year, on top of the $2 billion in guarantees already provided. In my view, this is a worthy investment, and it needs to be matched by continuing reforms by the Ukrainians. We are seeing progress on that front. The right people are in place, and the right laws are being passed. But at the end of the day, what will matter most is implementation. In President Shaskavili's testimony before the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee last week, he said something worth repeating, and I quote, it was not a NATO army that stopped the spread of communism. It was a collection of strong ideals with an army standing behind it. The same must be true today. A democratic, secure Ukraine is the last nation between a revanchist Russia and America. He was right. We need to double down across Eastern Europe and the former Soviet space on efforts to promote transparency, media, freedom, and other efforts. These fundamental democratic principles are what make us attractive. At the end of the day, as I've said, all of us in this room can agree on one key point. The United States 
must lead. American leadership counts. And that said, Dr. Brzezinski, you were absolutely right when you said, in this increasingly complicated geopolitical environment, and America in pursuit of a new, timely, strategic vision is crucial to helping the wor world avoid a dangerous slide into international turmoil. Let us show the world that strategic vision and the kind of leadership we have always shown in the past. Thank you very much for having me with you. Thank you very much, Senator Menendez, for your very wise and thoughtful introductory remarks to our program today. Uh, my name is Andy Cutchins. I'm director of the Russian Eurasia program here at CSIS. And I want to note that this event today is being organized under the auspices of the Brzezinski Institute, uh, which was just formed last year here at CSIS to try to bring greater historical and geographical perspective to the key challenges that we face in foreign policy and national security. So it is a special honor for me today, uh, as it always is, when I have the honor to introduce Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, for whom, of course, the Institute is named. He's been a mentor and a role model for my career, and I've had the pr privilege to work together with him here at CSIS, where he is counselor and trustee and co-chairs the CSIS advisory board. There's probably nobody around who's better equipped to address the questions that we are facing in today's discussions. For Dr. Brzezinski, I think there may be a sense of deja vu all over again. I've been there, done that. I remember in the early mid-1970s, we had a period in the U.S.-Soviet relationship that perhaps in more contemporary terms might have been referred to as a reset. Of course, I'm referring to detente, or as it was called in Russian at the time, relaxation of tensions. And this was formally initiated in 1972. Jimmy Carter became president in 1977, and of course his national security advisor at the time was Dr. Brzezinski. Detente policy was already quite controversial in Washington, as many thought that the Soviets were violating the spirit, if not the terms, of the so-called agreement. And it was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in December of 1979 that probably put the nail in the coffin of detente, perhaps analogously as the reset policy got its nail in the coffin with the Russian occupation of Crimea last February. And the question today, I think, is maybe this, a similar question to that in 1979, and perhaps a similar question to that of 1949. What do we do to respond in a period of much greater belligerence from Moscow? And how do we bring together our allies in Europe to work together with us to achieve the goals that we seek? Dr. Brzezinski, we look forward to sharing your, sharing your thoughts with us this afternoon. Senator. Andrew, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be able to take part in this discussion. And my starting point is a basic agreement with what the senator so eloquently outlined and so specifically uh, formulated. I'm going to have a narrower view. And it's based on the belief that it is now time for the United States to become more actively involved in shaping the outcome of the crisis that's going on and not merely reacting to the crisis. And there's an important difference between the two. And the latter implies a comprehensive victory, a success. Our values, our power, our intelligence will prevail. The latter requires a focus on what is feasible in the short run, and which takes into account not only our fundamental concerns, but some of Russia's concerns. For I am assuming that the outcome to this crisis is not going to be a one-sided victory, either for one or for the other. If it were for the Russians, it would involve, of course, a triumph for a regime that's in the process of self-redefinition ever since 2007, Putin's speech at the Verkunde conference in Germany 
and more recently in February and March, he has outlined a concept of a Russia, which is curiously antiquated, but intensely nationalistic, very preoccupied with status and power and full of resentments. And this is a regime which does proclaim, in effect, that it views the Western world, and particularly the Atlantic Alliance, as an enemy, an enemy that is to be undermined, the alliance to be split, and the maximum objectives of that intensely chauvinistic definition of Russia today are to be achieved. And if Russia does achieve them in Ukraine, by means which we have already witnessed, then of course it follows that the Baltic states may be next. They certainly were part of the Soviet Union. Worse, from Putin's point of view, they were part of the Tsarist Empire. Therefore, they should again be part of Russia. And that could lead to other places, whether it's Azerbaijan or Georgia, and of course, it would involve the collapse of the Atlantic Alliance. So indeed, a great deal is at stake for us here, and that's why we have to take it seriously. But let's not have a one-eyed vision of this problem. What is happening with Russia? First of all, its economy is on a very serious slide, very serious slide. And it is already an economy that's way behind the leading contenders for global economic and political influence. And I will not recite the whole litany of shortcomings that the Russian society confronts. And they have been made worse by the sanctions adopted by us. They assure the fact that years from now, still some years from now, and for some years to come, Russia will be an economy in crisis. That in itself is a very major development and cannot be ignored. Moreover, in addition to that, it is quite evident that some of Russia's immediate neighbors that Putin had hoped to recruit into the Eurasian Union, his original name for what was in effect an attempt to recreate the Soviet bloc, the Soviet Union, and the Tsarist Empire, is not going to be a Eurasian Union. The very best it might be is a Eurasian Economic Union. And that's the way some of Russia's immediate adjoining neighbors, compelled to go into it, have redefined it. And for example, Kazakhstan has been very important in that respect. And some of the other would-be members in it have been distancing themselves from it, insisting, in fact, on the word un economic union, but also insisting, in effect, without saying it, on political diversity. Look at the very complicated game the government of Belarus has been playing in order to maximize its independence, having until very recently been, in effect, a totally cowed Russian satellite. Look at Kazakhstan, and look at what is happening to the East. Increasingly, some of the former Soviet Asian republics are becoming closely associated with China and becoming members of a China-dominated sphere. So in effect, Russian internal crises and dangers are matching the prospective dangers that we are facing. And that has some important implications. Russia, too, could be in grave danger. Russian interests could be in grave danger. And there has to be some recognition, if not necessarily by the top leader over there, and I don't put ours in the same category, that a risky response, an all-out assault, will prevail. We do know enough about the Russian military that they are not ready, even for a major local war with the West, not to speak of a great war. In part, perhaps, Putin knows it too. And therefore, these strange and fundamentally counterproductive demonstrations of nuclear power, threats of nuclear weapons and overflights. And of course, if that is his determination, 
There's nothing we can do to stop it. That is the vulnerability of the moment. But we can also do things that can help, perhaps. Having scaled down what we hope to accomplish, and having recognized the fact that in any accommodation, there has to be give and take if it is to work. In my view, therefore, it follows from the foregoing, something with which I very much agree, namely what the senator was saying. I have also been saying it since the Verkunde meeting in Germany a year ago, immediately after the crisis started, that we should be willing to provide defensive weaponry to the Ukrainians. I still hold to that. But whereas I expected and hoped a year ago, we would say it at the very beginning of the crisis, I feel now in view of what has happened, the next step should be somewhat different than what would have been desirable a year ago. We now have to do it in a quiet way, simply warning Moscow privately that if there is a resumption of military action, directed, for example, at Mariupol or at other major cities, the United States will have no choice. We'll have no choice. We're not rushing to do it, but we'll have no choice but to provide defensive weaponry for the resisting Ukrainian forces. And we will do it on our own, or we'll do it with those of our allies who are willing to do it with us, because we recognize that there is the diversity of opinion as a subject in the alliance, but that cannot prevent either us or our immediate allies from doing what we may feel necessary. We may also choose, in those circumstances, to intensify some of the sanctions, implementing the sectoral sanctions, which are still potential, and the devastating consequences of which are well understood by both parties. In other words, we're telling the Russians, we know you're using force. And we know that we may not be able to stop you by countervailing force. But we will significantly increase the cost of the use of force, whether you're prevailing or not. And they know very well that their position in the region is deteriorating, whereas China's is rising. And a military engagement of some duration would be close to the kiss of death for the existing system. Secondly, in order to cool down the crisis and to return to some degree of normalcy in relations with Russia, some degree of normalcy, not normalcy, not return to the reset years, we also should indicate to Russia that we favor, we actually favor and expect that Ukraine's eventual place as a genuine European country, democracy, member of the EU, will not entail membership in NATO. For that, I don't think much of an explanation is necessary. Just take one look at the map and see what happens to the distance between a NATO country such as would Ukraine then become and Moscow and compare it to us and Canada. It's almost identical. It is very close to the capital in each case. This has a message. This has some content. And one cannot expect the Russians to be altogether indifferent to the notion that all of a sudden, a large 45 million nation becomes a member of NATO. And very relevant here is the fact that even polls taken, polls, P-O-L-L-S, polls taken in the last few days in Ukraine indicate the following um, attitudes on the part of the Ukrainian people. After everything that has happened, majority of Ukrainians prefer neutrality between the European Union and Russia. 63 find neutrality tolerable, while 31 say it is unacceptable. Um, in, the pro -European Western U in the pro-European Western Ukraine, only 48% of Ukrainians find neutrality tolerable and 48% intolerable. 
In other words, the Ukrainian public opinion is very divided on the extent of its formal association with the West, inclined to support membership with the EU, but hesitant, uncertain, concerned about the other, realizing that that is a step that can produce all sorts of negative consequences if push comes to shove. Now, only the United States, in the present circumstances, can undertake initiatives to explore the possibility of such an outcome. NATO, as we all know, has tried it. Uh, Chancellor Merkel, President Hollande, made a noble effort. They were treated in a patronizing fashion by Putin. Only the United States can do it, because that guarantees full-scale 100% attention. And it is only the United States that at this stage can say with confidence that such an arrangement would in fact serve the interests of the Ukrainian people, would be a step forward in the evolution of Europe, would be a potential long-term example for Russia without a war. And efforts to prevent it, and particularly its escalation by Russia, would produce a calamity. But one cannot hide behind the fear of a calamity in order to justify a posture of indifference. And this is why a more active international involvement today by the United States is necessary. We have deliberately allowed our allies to take the initiative because that helps to fortify a European stand, a stand in common within Europe and a stand in common, generally speaking, with us. But the risk in that today is that the next round of fighting could get out of control, could escalate. At that stage, our sudden response will be too late. At that stage, the Russians will be tempted to go all the way because they're already facing an extremely serious internal crisis. And therefore, in that present context, there are bound to be people in the Russian leadership who feel that some sort of an arrangement is in fact in Russia's interest. There is some professional judgment to the effect that the Russian army today is about three to four years before being effectively ready for a sustained military campaign against a well-armed, professionally developed, armed with modern weapons uh, military establishment, namely ours and to the extent that we can help the Ukrainians, eventually theirs. It's a striking analogy to the situation that prevailed in Europe in 1938-39. After the Anschluss, Hitler decided to go after Czechoslovakia. At that time, the German general staff, in particular its head, warned Hitler that Germany is not ready, that Germany will be ready to wage a serious war against serious enemies roughly by 1943, and not started in 1939. We know the rest of the story. I strongly suspect that there are people in the financial world in Russia and in the military that knows that some sort of an outcome, accepting the reality of a Europe-oriented, but not a NATO embracing uh, accommodation, is in the mutual interest of the two. I think it's well worth the effort it is not a capitulation. It is not a shameful compromise. It is, in fact, paving the way to the political self-assertion of the Ukrainians. And eventually, after Putin is no longer there, for Russia to traverse the same road. Because Russia's squeeze between the West and China has only one clear choice to make, but it has to qualify for it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Excuse me, Kaczynski. My name is Heather Conley. I'm the director of the Europe program here at CSIS, and what a privilege to hear from you both. Um, because of the shortness of time, we'll just do a, a few Q and A's here for uh, for some discussion. I have so many questions, but I, I'd like to begin by asking both of you 
Senator Menendez, you painted a picture of strong American leadership and engagement, rethinking America's force posture in Europe, a long-term strategic framework. And Dr. Brzezinski, you too spoke of a, a long-term perspective here, and a, quite a very dangerous uh, potential for escalation. I think, though, both Europe and the United States have adopted a, a, a policy of strategic patience. And in fact, Dr. Brzezinski, you've cautioned about being patient and being confident. Does this mean, uh, in uh, the German foreign minister quoted last week saying, maybe it will last a generation to create the conditions that we can talk about a solution to the conflict. How do you sync strategic patience and waiting this out potentially with sanctions and, and escalating pain to what you both were talking about, which is a much more energetic U.S. leadership model, which has some elements to what our position was in the Cold War, strong American engagement in Europe. Senator Menendez, I'll begin with you first. Well, I'm, if to the extent that there's going to be strategic patience, and I hope it's not a generation uh, that, that we're talking about, uh, I still believe that strength avoids provocation. Weakness invites it. Uh, and from that perspective, uh, I would lay the foundations uh, for having Russia understand that there are consequences for violating the international order and hopefully getting it to change its calculation sooner rather than later. Um, and as Dr. Brzezinski suggested, there may be ways of doing that to find a, an, an off-ramp uh, for Russia. But I don't believe that uh, looking at Putin's speeches, uh, and if you follow his speeches, you've seen where he's followed up in real action, uh, and what's happened in, in Georgia and Tristinia, and uh, certainly what's happened in Crimea and onwards, that he has moved in a direction that despite the patience that has been shown in terms of the responses that could have already been generated, that has not deterred him. So I think that the calculation for him has to be changed or else you will see more aggression. Uh, Minx one didn't produce very much for very long. Minx two uh, actually almost codified what the rebels took uh, and created more difficulties for Ukraine as it relates to controlling its border. I just don't see it moving in the type of direction that we'd want to see. Well, strategic patience is like a rubber band. You know, you can stretch it, stretch it, but at some point it snaps. And I think it's important to get the situation under control before it snaps. And Putin's not gonna be around forever. So the problem is how to find a formula right now which stabilizes a situation, but without a one-sided victory for one side. And yes, I hate to see uh, Ukraine being deprived of Crimea. I am sorry that they're losing part of its eastern territories, although that section is inhabited heavily by Russians, actual Russians, not Russian-speaking Ukrainians. But the point is that we can stabilize it. We can stabilize it and achieve our central objective, which is a Ukraine, which is permitted to express and attain a status in a Europe that it wishes to join. A Europe that's democratic, that gives its people the same opportunities that Europeans have, that over time can have the same kind of economic success that Poland has achieved, none of which was achieved in the last 20 years. It was a period of rampant opportunism, corruption, four presidents establishing a unique record in which each successor was worse than the predecessor. And that's quite, a, quite an achievement. Um, I think Ukrainians deserve that, and they deserve our support. But they don't necessarily want to be members of NATO, and that petrifies the Russians. And also, Putin is using it effectively as a mobilizing tool for anti-Western sentiments. It seems to me much more sensible to strive for an arrangement whereby, as I have said in my comments, Ukraine has the opportunity to progress towards Europe. And that's not a one-year event. That takes years. I'll just remind you that Turkey has, on the, has been on the list for membership 
since the 1960s, and they require meeting a number of steps. It will take time for Ukraine to achieve it. In the meantime, things will change in Russia, I am convinced, because Russia has no other alternative to become a big satellite of China. If you look at the map, that's the alternative. And it's not very appealing to the Russians. There is also a Ukraine, a Russian middle class that's increasingly Western oriented, today intimidated. But before too long, it will start resurfacing as it was beginning to resurface under Medvedev. And then Putin came back, having taken a little rest after his speech in Verkund in 2007. And then he rushed forward with this progressive institutionalization of a nationalistic, chauvinistic, imperialistic dogma, which he's now trying to implement. I don't think that will work in the longer run. And we don't know how long he's going to be around. But if in the meantime we can achieve some stabilization on that basis, we will avert what otherwise might be a slide into a conflict in which inevitably both sides escalate and counter-escalate. And then who knows what will happen. But I don't think whatever happens will be very congenial. I have one, one last question as we wrap it up. I'll break it into two parts. Senator Menendez, are you concerned that um, President Putin will continue on, that uh, Mariupol extending that land bridge between uh, Crimea and, and the Russian Federation is, uh, is, is a, p a potential? Do you see this expanding? And then secondly, I, I'd love your thoughts uh, on, on uh, the tragic murder of Boris Nemtsov. And Dr. Brzezinski said a few months ago here at CSIS that, uh, that Russia's nationalist chauvinism can potentially slide into fascism. And we're seeing this incredible uh, uh, the propaganda. They're whipping this passion uh, within the Russian people of anti-Americanism. Uh, are, are, are we concerned that we're seeing right now an environment that even President Putin cannot control? Well, let me take to the second part of your two-part question. I'll do both of them. But first of all, I'm deeply sad that Boris Nemtsov lost his life so tragically. And I have a very difficult time seeing the latest allegations that some Islamist uh, drive was the reason for his assassins. Of course, uh, thinking about uh, any system of justice inside of Russia is also very difficult to comprehend. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just amazed, and I think it may engender uh, his uh, supporters, and so supporters, uh, to be strengthened in their resolve uh, as it relates to trying to create peaceful change inside of Russia. But uh, uh, it's very difficult to, to believe some of the statements that are being made, as it was very difficult to believe the initial statements that it was outside influences in the West and others uh, trying to do this. So. Uh, but there, there is a danger if real justice doesn't take place at the end of the day as to how people will respond and, and whether that response can be channeled in a way that is powerful but peaceful. As it relates to my concerns, I am concerned. I truly believe that left unchecked, uh, President Putin will continue to march on. Uh, Every ceasefire has been clearly violated. We've seen more uh, Russian troops beyond that which I saw when we were uh, listening to the Ukrainians when I was there last year at the beginning of this whole process. Um, you have an enormous number of, I think, 20 some odd thousand in Crimea. You have several thousand in the eastern uh, part of Ukraine. Uh, it's very difficult also for Ukraine to have stability economically despite everything that we are doing with the IMF, despite the reforms that they are undertaking, which are to be applauded. And my own personal view is that this is probably the best leadership Ukraine has had in quite some time. But the reality is if you keep bleeding through a conflict in eastern Ukraine, it is very difficult to stabilize yourself. And, you know, Putin is well known for creating frozen conflicts. And so I just think that even to freeze the set of circumstances at where they're at uh, requires a stronger, more significant U.S. leadership role, working with our European allies and bringing them to a point that they can understand. And of course, you know, 
I'm not a big promoter of exporting U.S. energy abroad because I like the competitive advantage it gives us here at home uh, to reassert manufacturing and whatnot. But if you can strategically, in a global market, if you can strategically help the Europeans with energy in the interim as they bridge towards their ultimate needs, that's a powerful opportunity as well to liberate them more uh, to deal with, with the Russian uh, challenge that we have. Those are, in addition to my remarks that I made formally, those are some of the things I think we just need to do and to alter the course of events. The course of events as they're headed are not good. Dr. Brzezinski, final words. Well, I would merely reiterate the basic point, namely, neither side in the short run can prevail over the other side without setting in motion consequences that will be dynamic, destructive, and unpredictable. Each of us, in terms of the two sides, faces problems with the cohesion of the alliance, faces problems with the willingness of respective societies to engage in a contest that could lead, ultimately, to a hellish confrontation. And both need some sort of initiative which gives each side the basis for saying, in terms of fundamental interests, we prevailed. For us, it is an independent Ukraine that can be a member of Europe, and its future is assured. For the Russians, it's some assurance that NATO doesn't make a giant step forward, very close strategically to the inside of Russia, and demonstrates, in effect, the mo dramatic geopolitical defeat for Putin. Beyond that, each side has additional problems with third world issues, other conflicts, and for Putin, the neighbor to the east. So they both have a potential stake in some accommodation, but it has to be triggered by a decisive power that has a, that has a strategic vision of what it wishes to accomplish. Thank you. Senator Menendez, this is the first time you've been, I think, at CSIS, so we're so delighted that you were with us. Thank you for your, your strong message, and we understand you and Senator Corker are holding a hearing tomorrow on, on this subject, so more to follow. We'll look forward to your leadership there. And Dr. Brzezinski, it's a great privilege. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. And please join me in thanking our fantastic panelists for a great discussion. Thanks. Very good.